Today on Airborne, Oshkosh numbers were down, but Hightower says AirVenture was solid. A woman who never intended to be a pilot is the 99's new president. And the FAA announces flight restrictions for the upcoming Republican National Convention. I'm Ashley Hale. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. Official attendance numbers for AirVenture are in, and the number of people through the turnstiles topped 500,000, but just barely. EAA President and CEO Rod Hightower said that 508,000 people attended the show, adding, quote, that's a tremendous total considering the intensely hot weather, storms, and struggles in the overall economy. Still, the numbers are down from the previous three years, including the infamous slosh kosh of 2010. Last year, EAA reported 541,000 people came to Wisconsin for the show. In the previous year, with persistent rains causing widespread flooding across the grounds, some 535,000 people and 10,000 planes arrived at Whitman Regional. The event set an attendance record in 2009, reporting 578,000 visitors. Even so, Hightower was satisfied with the show, saying, quote, this was a solid year at AirVenture, and most importantly, it was a safe event. Hightower went on to promise bigger and better things for 2013. Well, the 99th, an international organization of women licensed pilots, recently installed 71-year-old Martha Phillips of Newbury Park, California, as its latest international president. The 5,000-member organization is headquartered in Oklahoma City. Its first president was Amelia Earhart. The Ventura County Star reports that Phillips has been a longtime member of the organization, serving in varied local and regional capacities. She co-chaired the International Conference in Hawaii in 2010. Phillips received her pilot certificate in 1987. She and her husband Art, who's also a licensed pilot, fly a Cessna 172 they've nicknamed Bluebird. They've owned it for over 30 years. She told the paper that she really didn't intend to get a pilot's license, but wanted to be able to land the plane if her husband were to become incapacitated. But once she started to learn, she went on to earn her private pilot certificate. Now, as international president of the 99s, Phillips will fly across the country, appearing at chapter meetings and other events. One of her first appearances as president was at Air Venture last week. The FAA said Wednesday it will be issuing TFRs in support of the Republican National Convention, taking place later this month in Tampa, Florida. The FAA says the restrictions are designed to provide a safe and secure environment for the event. The airspace defined in the advanced advisory and the published NOTAM will be classified as national defense airspace. Pilots who do not adhere to the published procedures may be intercepted, detained, and interviewed by law enforcement and security personnel. Violating the TFR can result in administrative action against the pilot, including imposing civil penalties and the suspension or revocation of airman certificates. Criminal charges or the use of deadly force against the airborne aircraft if it's determined that the aircraft poses an imminent security threat. Multiple TFRs will be enforced during the convention, and operations at night airport will be prohibited when the TFRs are in force. Pilots are strongly advised to check NOTAMs before flying in the Tampa area the last few days of August. As the FAA says, the TFRs can be changed with little or no notice. Those TFRs are currently set to be in place August the 26th through the 30th. Log on to our website, www.aero-news.net, for complete details and coordinates. You're watching Airborne on Aero TV. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing in crosswinds and learning proper crosswind landing techniques. Even today, most crosswind landing skills are learned through trial and error, sometimes with disastrous results. 
Believe it or not, the most common contributing factor in weather-related accidents each year is crosswinds. The second most common factor is wind gusts. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. It teaches pilots the proper techniques to meet and beat these top two causes of weather-related landing accidents. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in challenging crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird flight simulations, the Redbird X-Wind SE, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne, Aero TV, our website or our podcast, drop us an email to news by at aero-news.net. The Senate Commerce Committee voted Tuesday to report out the nomination of Acting FAA Administrator Michael Huerta to the full Senate. The move clears the way for a vote by the full body to remove the acting designation from Huerta's title and start the clock on a full five-year term in the agency's top job. The Commerce Committee vote comes just days before the Senate adjourns for its annual August break. Political observers say Huerta faces an uphill battle in the full Senate. If approved, his term would last a full five years, regardless of the outcome of the November presidential election. It's not known if there will be enough support in the Senate to give Huerta the top job at the FAA, for a period which would last through the possible first term of a Romney administration. However, the two have worked together before during the Salt Lake City Olympics. The FAA has published a notice of proposed rulemaking in the Federal Register that would clarify its policy towards residential through the fence access to airports by private individuals. The FAA's longstanding policy had been to discourage residential through the fence agreements at general aviation airports. In March 2011, the agency adopted an interim policy that allowed existing through the fence agreements to continue upon certain conditions. GA advocates added language to the recently passed FAA reauthorization bill to permit new through the fence agreements. A through the fence agreement allows a person who owns a residential property adjacent to the airport to have access to the airfield. Now the FAA has again revised its policy and has again added conditions for through the fence agreements, including residents must pay suitable access charges, residents bear the cost of building and maintaining the infrastructure to provide access, residents maintain their property as residential, non-commercial only, residents prohibit any through access via their property, and residents prohibit any aircraft refueling on their property. The NPRM seeks public comment on this new policy. Those comments must be received by August 29th. Space Florida, the state of Florida's Spaceport Authority and Aerospace Economic Development Agency, and the FAA's Office of Commercial Space partnered in November 2011 to commission a study prepared by the Tory Group on the forecast 10-year demand for suborbital reusable vehicles. The results, which also identified ways the government and commercial sector could impact the industry, revealed that the suborbital market could be worth up to $1.6 billion over the next 10 years. The research and analysis focused process is considered a conservative first analysis of the suborbital flight segments for personal space flight and science missions. The U.S. Senate Commerce Committee has unanimously approved bipartisan legislations sponsored by Senators Claire McCaskill and John Thune that would protect American consumers and jobs from a European Union tax on the U.S. airline industry. The legislation now heads to the full Senate for consideration. Since January, airline carriers landing in or departing from EU countries, including flights between the U.S. and EU countries, have been subject to the EU's emissions trading system, an emissions trading program that levies a tax on U.S. airline carriers related to European countries' interest in reaching their own internal goals for carbon emissions. You're watching Airborne on Aero TV. 
We're back with more in a moment, including Jim Campbell's barnstorming commentary. Avidyne is the brand of choice for pilots who want innovative, easy to use avionics. And the new IFD 540 GPS Navcom sets a new standard for simplicity in communication and LPV navigation. As a slide in replacement for existing 530 series navigators, and with a highly intuitive touchscreen control, the IFD 540 makes it much easier to access the information you want when you want it, reducing head down time and making flying more enjoyable. Finally, you have a choice, and the choice is easy. Avidyne. We're back, and it's time for our weekly visit from ANN's Editor-in-Chief, Jim Campbell, with his always stimulating and thought-provoking barnstorming commentary. Today, Jim tells us Oshkosh 2012 will not soon be forgotten. Thanks, Ashley. Hi, folks. If you don't mind, folks, I'm going to keep it brief because, quite frankly, I just got back from Oshkosh last night. thought about, it, uh, about Oshkosh on the way back. EAA is in a huge state of flux. The membership is restless, and they should be. The Air Venture Cup race, what happened to flying and cannon, treatment of volunteers, the chalets, and what appears to be a, at least a symbolic abandoning of its home building roots. Well, let's put it this way. EAA listens a little bit. They're starting to listen a lot. I think they know they've got some problems, and I've got a feeling they may actually try to address them. We saw Hightower at work. We got a chance to see him a little bit closer up than we have in the past. And he did something that we hadn't seen in a lot of other leadership in the Aviation Association matrix. He admitted they got some things wrong. He also admitted they are going to be corrected. That gives me a lot of hope. No leader is perfect, but the leader who can address and admit errors or problems and do something about them, that's a guy we can get behind. Not, uh, not totally convinced yet, but I'm starting to warm up to the guy. We'll see. Uh, on the AOPA front, I'm hearing an awful lot in the industry, the uh, flight planning game and the AOPA insistence on interfering with other industries, whether it be flight planning or the media or insurance or a number of other things, are really rubbing a lot of people raw. Craig has huge problems on his hands, and a lot of folks who think he needs to be replaced were beginning to think the same as well. We saw Michael Huerta for his first uh, big public outing. We were not impressed. He evaded. He acted like a bureaucrat. And basically, the duck test pretty much revealed that he walked, talked, and acted like a bureaucrat and didn't seem to be interested in doing anything but. We saw Jim Inhofe, a senator from Oklahoma, like the guy, the fellow who put through the Pilots' Bill of Rights that we've been working on for 25 years. Happy to see it. We saw Sam Graves at work, really like where he's going. The thing we liked most of all was a membership and a constituency at EAA and among the folks at Oshkosh that were highly aware of what was going around and beginning to get organized and beginning to raise their voice. That's the first step in any corrective action. Aviation is drastically in need of transformation, but transformation starts with the person, the individual, all banding together to seek effective change. The next few weeks and months are going to be incredibly interesting. For the Aero News Network, Aero TV, and of course Airborne, I'm Jim Campbell, and I'm going to take a nap. Finally this week, on July 20th, 1969, millions around the world watched as Neil Armstrong first set foot on the moon. The television signal was beamed around the world and watched by all races on all continents. It was an iconic moment in history. This weekend, NASA plans to land its 2,000-pound car-sized rover, Curiosity, on Mars. And while historic, it's doubtful the TV ratings will be as dramatic. The landing is expected at 10.31 p.m. Pacific Time, August 5th, Sunday night, or 1.31 a.m. Eastern Time, Monday morning, August 6th. Curiosity's landing will mark the start of a two-year prime mission to investigate whether one of the most intriguing places on Mars ever has offered an environment favorable for microbial life. NASA TV will provide live coverage of the landing, and one thing you can do now that you couldn't do in 1969, you can follow the mission on Facebook or Twitter. You know, somehow I just don't think it would have been the same if Armstrong would have tweeted those famous words, that's one small step for man. And we'll never know how many might have logged on Facebook to like a photo of those first footprints on the moon. 
Remember, Airborne is seen not once, but twice weekly on Aero TV on Tuesdays and Fridays. And for your daily aviation news, remember to check out our website at www.aero-news.net. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you next week. Thank <laughs> you.